Hello and konnichiwa to Mr. C History. I am here in Holland Park, specifically the Kyoto Garden. Today I'm on a bit of a journey to discover the land of the rising sun, its history here in Britain and Britain's impact also on Japan. To see what we can find here in the UK that can tell us a bit about Japanese history, that rich, rich culture. Now this garden was created in 1992 for the Japanese exhibition, but I just wanted to come here to talk a little bit about modern Japanese history, just to set a bit of context. Between the 1600s, about 1630s, right up to the 1850s, Japan was totally isolated. This was a policy called Sakuku by the Tokugawa shogunate, uh, and they essentially said no foreigners can come to Japan, no people can leave Japan, trading would be very very restrictive with anyone so Britain didn't have very little influence in this time period and we didn't get much here either so Japan was very very isolated which means it's got a very unique and very rich culture and then in the 1860s that policy totally changed known as the Meiji Restoration Japan suddenly said right hello world we are here and they industrialized they traded they fought wars with the Russians they entered the world stage but with all that, let's now go and have a look at some sites here in the UK that we can find out a bit more about Japanese history. This is the Victoria and Albert Museum and room number 45 in there is the Japan room. Now the V&A has had a long history since it started in 1852 of collecting items from Japan and they have a real rich treasure in there. Good place to see some artifacts from Japanese history. I mean, yes, they've got some lovely porcelain in there, some beautiful prints, uh, lovely kimonos as well. I particularly like the tea making kits, the sort of teapots and little things like that. There is, of course, the majestic samurai soldiers there, complete with their swords as well, sitting there in their beautiful uh, uniform from the 1800s. They even have a laptop made by Toshiba in 1985. That the 1980s, the turning point in the Japanese economy, where suddenly everything was made in Japan and people in America were quite fearful of that. And these huge Japanese companies like Sony, etc., Toshiba, came forward. So, if you want more Japanese history? Come to the V&A. Behind me, by the very busy dual carriageway A2 in Gillingham in Kent, is a memorial to William Adams, a very significant person in English-Japanese relations. Well, William Adams was the first Englishman to set foot in Japan. He also was the first foreigner to achieve samurai status. Now, his history is quite interesting. He was born here in Gillingham in 1564, and he served in Elizabeth I's Navy, and eventually joining the Dutch East India Company and on their expedition into the Pacific. He sailed for two years. Uh, four of the five ships that sailed to Japan with this Dutch East Indian Company, they sank. His was the only boat to survive. Eventually bedraggled, exhausted, and petrified in the year 1600, William Adams arrived in Kyushu into the southern island of Japan. Now initially they were arrested, and they thought to be spies, and he was taken all the way to Osaka Castle and held prisoner there, where he met Tokugawa Ayushu, the future shogun, uh, the future ruler of most of Japan. And Tokugawa was very impressed with him. And William Adams said to him, look, I can teach you how to make good boats. I even speak English and help you trade with lots of people around the world. And Tokugawa said, oh, okay, that's a good idea and forms a strong bond with Tokugawa, who bestows on him the great honor of being samurai, the first foreigner to do so. He has to change his name to Anji Miura, and he's banished from ever leaving Japan ever again. And so he never goes back to his wife and child in, here in Gillingham. And indeed, they thought he was dead. Um, and so I think she remarried, etc. He also married in Japan, eventually dying in 1620. There's statues to him uh, in Hirado, I think, down in the south of Japan and also in Yokohama. And there's a festival for him every April in Japan. So he's a real hero there. Maybe he's a little bit forgotten here in Britain by this busy road. But uh, there we go, William Adams, a very significant player in English-Japanese relations. This is the Imperial War Museum. And inside there is a very important piece of Japanese history. It is a casing to Little Boy, the nuclear bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima on August the 6th, 1945. Now before that, 
Tokyo and Japan had been bombed relentlessly by American and British bombers, but the Japanese were not giving in, they were not surrendering. Indeed, the American army was having to fight through the Pacific, all these tiny Pacific islands, expelling lots and lots of human lives and money and expense and everything to try and take little islands. The Japanese were not surrendering. So ha President Harry Truman, President of the United States Harry Truman, had to make a decision. Does he engage in a decades-long war with Japan, possibly costing him a million men? Or does he use this new weapon developed by Robert Oppenheimer in the Los Alamos Laboratory through the Manhattan Project that releases atomic energy in a form of a weapon? And it, possibly would, it probably would end the war. For Harry Truman, the choice was simple. So on August 6, 1945, the aeroplane Enola Gay, the Super Fortress B-29 Super Fortress plane Enola Gay, took off from Tinian Airfield on the northern Mariana Islands and at 8.15 in the morning it arrived at Hiroshima. Major Thomas Ferrami, the bomber, he dropped the bomb, the little boy bomb, and 43 seconds after dropping, the bomb detonated. Now, the interesting thing about nuclear weapons, they actually detonate not on, but before they get to the ground, 500 meters above ground, and a bright white light went across, blinding anyone, anyone who could have seen it. An incredible heat wave of just bursting would have incinerated anyone within a mile radius. Similarly, the blast would have also taken out any building. And in the end, 69% of Hiroshima's buildings totally destroyed, because a lot of it was made of wood. Further 10% or so damaged beyond ability. Within about a minute and a half, 70 to 80,000 people had been killed, an unbelievable amount. And a long time after that, there was horrendous destruction. But what is interesting, when you go in there and look at Little Boy, it is small, it is really, really tiny. And you just think, how on earth could something so small create so much unbelievable death and destruction? It is very frightening and disquieting. I'm in Tavistock Square in the centre of London and this is a cherry tree planted by the Mayor of Camden, as it says there, in memory of the victims of Hiroshima. And this is a good place to talk about the impact of that atomic bomb or those two atomic bombs on Japan. And there was an obvious impact, unbelievable destruction, two major cities, two major economic hubs totally destroyed, that's going to massively impact the Japanese economy. An unbelievable death, uh, 140,000 died in, in Hiroshima, 74,000 died in Nagasaki just in 1945. Many, many, it, it's almost incalculable how, how many died from the radiation poisoning and the effects after that. There's also uh, interesting the survivors. So this is says to the victims of Hiroshima. It may not just be those who died with the victims, they Hibakushu as they're known, those who survived the bombing. They had horrendous survivors guilt, but they were also shunned by the people of Japan because they felt that they might be radiation so toxic in some way. So these poor people suffered immensely afterwards as well. Japan, as I say, economically was greatly impacted. It had to be bailed out by the United States. I wonder if there was an element of guilt there by America. And America flooded Japan with lots of sort of technology and in infrastructure. And interestingly, also flooded it with cheap American wheat, which created ramen noodles. So maybe there's something that comes out of it there. And then, of course, well, the main impact of it all globally is this idea we have nuclear weapons. The, the power of nuclear weapons is shown. And it's very interesting that they've never been used again. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were so un horrendous, so unbelievably horrible, that the world has striven to never ever use them again, hopefully. Now there's several Japanese rock gardens in London. This is the one at the top of the SOAS Brunei Gallery, the SOAS School of Oriental Asian Studies. And this is quite a nice calm one because there's often not many people here and there's a lot of buzz of students and various other people out front and so it's always nice to come up here and be calm. And these are really interesting, these Japanese rock gardens. Everything does have a sense of purpose. It may look like random rocks put over there and gravel, but everything does represent something, whatever it is, to the person who's designed it. And the gravel is expertly raked every morning. And it's this Japanese concept of ma, which means the use, the excellent use of empty space. But I just like it because it's a relaxing place to be and for me to contemplate and think about the journey I've been on here with Japanese history in Britain. There's not been too much uh, and it's not surprising really. This is a country that wasn't colonised by Britain. It was closed off for so long but it is an intriguing country and there are snippets there within this uh, London and of course in Kent. So anyway as always I hope you've enjoyed that. Please don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you on the next one. 
Sayonara. Arigato. Arigato.